Welcome to Night Coast at Nightly. I'm Jonathan Alvin, Game Master J, and this is one of our few holidays episodes. And so I wanted to wish you all the happy holidays, whatever their, your culture or philosophy is. Welcome, 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 and we are glad to have you with us. Drinking a bit of warm coffee to uh, not only warm me up, but also to wake me up a bit. And tonight we're going to be adding to a recently started series, which is more Game Master Secrets. Uh, as a Game Master with very nearly 50 years of experience, I want to share with you some of the real uh, simple tricks, techniques, things that will help your game sessions go better. So today we're going to be talking about uh, nine of them as usual, and we are going to be explaining how they work and how you can use them to improve your game playing experience and the enjoyment of your players. So the first thing we're going to talk about is something called the Keystone Rule of Eight. And this is not something that I originated, but something that I kind of instinctively glommed onto long ago and have been using constantly throughout my game's experience to help me understand and to balance the game sessions so that the players feel the danger and the threat and yet I as a game master can feel the confidence and balance in maintaining the, uh, the, the, the very feel of equality between the players and the monsters. And the fundamental basis of the rule of eight is simple statistics and it works in a 20 a D20 system or a 20 a 20 a 20 sided dice mechanism the number comes out to be 8 because of the concepts of statistical significance and um, applicability when you are looking at a combat situation where you want the players to have a somewhat of an edge you need to find a way to make their side of the numbers uh, balance out slightly better and so by utilizing an intrinsic rule of eight you accomplish this and it's a little arcane and it's also a little simplistic so i'm going to say it both ways and see how you, uh, which of them works better for you when i say the rule of eight what i am referring to is that on any given die roll with a success target of a nominal value, you should need the players to roll an eight or better for success. Now, in many systems, it's that simple, where you simply set your threshold at eight or better and that is done with it. But in role play games where they obfuscate and disguise the numeric value somewhat by putting attack modifiers on the dice rolls or providing players a bonus or a benefit upon reaching certain levels or targets in the game. The a concept of the roll of eight is simply to keep finding ways to make sure that the players are succeeding generally on eight or better out of a d20. And that comes out to mathematically about a 60% success rate. And that small measure, 10% above the pure flat average, tends to lend itself to the players succeeding it often enough to balance the situation so that they feel the threat of it because that 50-50 even shot is literally a die roll difference between success and failure. So by gauging it downward a bit so that your target is an eight for the players, then you're giving them a slight advantage in the engagement, especially if you scale the monsters so that their numbers are 10 or better. So. That small margin of error is enough to give the illusion of uh, success. Now, players that are watching this might be appalled that the numbers would be modified in the game to give them an advantage. But if you think about it, as, even as a player, it makes sort of sense to hold that premise because you want players to continue to play. And if they have a... 50 for 50 per shot of being eliminated it's you know not not worth it to the, for their effort so this keystone rule therefore becomes important because you can change that or adjust it as the fighting goes on 
to either increase or decrease the danger. So as the players are being increase, increasingly successful and they're running into different challenges, then perhaps they're getting too much of an easy t chance of it, in which case you modify the numbers upward. Boop. Or on the opposite side, if they are having a struggle, then you certainly can adjust it downward. But generally by keeping the numbers at a keystone of eight, then you're able to keep the game feeling equitable to the players. Second of all is maintain the mysteries in myth. In other words, when you are engaging the players, you do not have to tell them everything that the monsters can do. They, you do not have to share with them all of the elements of the uh, stuff behind the curtain, so to speak, so that if you wish to have them engage the same monster at a later time, then if you've given away the farm, so to speak, if you've told them everything that they can possibly know, then there's no mystery to it. So maintain mysteries will make it so that the players will be in, excited or interested to engage with the same monster at a later time. Now, if you think about it from another standpoint too, the idea of maintaining the mystery not only allows you to reuse a monster, it also makes the players intrigued enough to potentially hunt those monsters down in the future and find where their, where their lair is and so on. So it it enhances the story flow as well. This next one may feel a little bit odd, but LTWW is my acronym for Let the Wookie Win. Sometimes it's best to abdicate a fight. Let the let the monsters defeat your heroes, or defeat uh, let the let the heroes defeat your monsters. Um, overcome the the difficulty or whatever. Because in some, in some cases, they need a break. Sometimes players just want to continue the story and they don't want to be tied down with a bogged down fight. So um, sometimes that makes sense. But letting the Wookiee win is on a different level also uh, lets them know that you're in control of the situation so that they can begin to trust you as a storyteller more deeply so that you can then entrust them with uh, deeper lore and have them stay on task because they'll start to understand the balance between you and the team, so to speak. This idea of LTWW can be as simple as uh, the die rolling is hand waved and you just simply say they defeat the monster. It's sometimes that's all it takes. You know, if the players have challenged a villain and the villain is ill equipped, the villain is going to quit. I think one of the more powerful ones, and I've enjoyed using it quite a bit because when you answer questions with questions, you often create even more questions. So, for example, if my players uh, ask about, you know, what's going on with NPC such and such? He didn't seem himself today. Oh, he didn't? Hmm. I wonder what might be bothering him. The players are going to be intrigued. They're going to want to find out more. If they say, I noticed that the back door on the inn was open last night. Oh, was it? Hmm. I wonder what that could mean. By, by not directly answering a question, sometimes you create a more deep relationship question from the players and a more deep relationship with the story for the players, for the characters. So by not always being a bleak, I mean, not always being abrupt and don't, not always being a fact of the matter, but instead leaving some of it open to ambiguity, you give yourself and your players a chance to consider what these alternate options might represent. Pardon me. In many role-play games, I'm going to go on to the next one here. In many, many role-playing games, the structure of the game is such that it is not the armor class, it's not the weaponry, it's not the uh, health, cake, health fields that matter, but rather the action economy. How many things that the players can do 
versus how many things the villains or monsters can do. And in many of the game structures that are out there, this becomes problematic as you're doing adventures with higher level monsters. They tend to have as many attacks as the players, if not fewer. And there's generally one or two of them and the players, there's usually many. So this concept of action economy tends to therefore play into it and game masters try to find ways to uh, reduce a player's options or to say no to what players might do. And this is actually an illusion. You see in a, an engagement in a fight scene, there are more factors than just the, uh, the villains and the heroes. There are, uh, in certain cases, it might be NPCs that are not directly part of the story but become so. Or perhaps it is the environment itself becomes adversarial and the players have to use their actions to overcome the dangers of the very environment they are in. Perhaps the action economy issue can be mitigated or, or moderated by having the players be concerned with other things than just the monster, the villain. And furthermore, many of the monsters have justifications for more actions than are, war than are normally warranted. For instance, a large creature such as a dragon m might have claw claw bite attacks, but it also more and more likely have a wing beat, will more than likely have a tail swipe, will sometimes have a physical uh, push actions or simply because of their size, causing there to be more actions that the players have to interact with than just the monster's normal uh, cadre or a normal, a normal group of actions. There's going to be more to be resultant with. And by realizing that the action economy is an illusion created in many parts by the players wanting to hold the, the control of the game, it lets you as a storyteller be able to amplify the outcomes of your creatures in the game in the combat now most games have a progressive mechanism where you advance so many points for so many actions and you eventually get a level up or a boost or something and these usually are stepped and progressive but they usually also lag between, behind the action of a game. And one of the things that I found that works really good and is highly effective is the idea of providing interim merit awards. When the players do something particularly on point and specifically useful for the game, then you should provide them with a, an immediate uh, reward mechanism of some sort even if it was a symbol modifier of plus one in the next round of action or something, but give them something and let them know where it was justified from so that they will see why they want to include those parts of the game that are optimal for you as a storyteller. This idea of an interim merit award system led to what I call blessing points, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. And that is this, the power of blessing points are this. I generate the concept of a separate number of points that a player or players can earn by the actions in game that promote or advance the storyline, perhaps things that are particularly funny, clever, selfless. And these, these points then can be used not only to modify their own dice rolls, which is normal for progressive games, but also to interfere with or adjust my rules. And so by having a way to literally take back some agency or shift some luck in the game scene while they're acting, it, it makes sense. And the power of these blessing points is that I've come up with a mechanism and I'll go into more detail in an entire episode on it perhaps. But the, uh, idea of the blessing point gives the players the ability to adjust my die rolls or modify their own or add, uh, request a particular instance to occur in the game. This is all things that these points can be used for. But the main power of them is it lets the players 
recognize when you feel they're doing a good job. And there's nothing like getting people to do a good job like letting them know that they are. And this next point may seem redundant, but I, I recommend that if you haven't done so yet, consider the idea of reintroducing role-playing. And by that, I mean the players certainly build a character by a role-playing mechanism and they create the persona that they want to play in your environment and they develop the uh, persona, but they don't do much with the role of the character in game. There are mechanisms that are obvious. For example, if someone takes on the role of being a uh, cartographer, then you certainly have them do the mapping during the game sessions. That's an, an idea of role playing. A second would be, okay, they are the financier, so you make them responsible for any transactions dealing with the money. So therefore they're feeling the role in their play. And the engagement with social beings, if you are a bard or a minstrel, perhaps you should be the one doing all of the introductions and the dialogue with the monsters and such. And by reintroducing this role play, you give the players a more visceral feel for what it is to be that other person. And perhaps you can actually get them therefore to be involved in the acting process by acting in that role, not just being in charge of the administration of the die rolls and the monitoring, monitoring of the combat, but instead of the idea of, okay, we want to develop a combat strategy, so you should be in this position and you should be in that position and build up on their role as the military person in the group. All of these give the players a deeper feeling of being part of the group and a stronger feel of being part of the change that the group can represent in the game world. Finally, the last one here I want to talk about is in, enacting your version of Yosidemi. Now, I say it that way intentionally, and you may have heard this uh, presentation before, part of it, but the idea here of the Yosidemi comes back, comes from an old TV show well before most of your times, a show called Lassie. And in that show, the lead character was a little boy, well, the lead, lead, lead of the show, of course, was Lassie a collie, a dog, but the, the, the male lead, if you will, was a boy named Timmy. And all the way through the story, every episode would have Timmy involved in whatever action that Lassie was drawing in, whatever drama was being developed. But at the end of the show, the uncle would always come over and put his arm on the little boy's shoulder and say, you see, Timmy, this is what happened, and this is what it means, and this is how it should affect you. And this you see to me, as I call it, is a great way at the end of each session for your players to see how the direction you are leading them, or the direction they are traveling, is feeding into the larger story and how their actions can impact the story both positively and negatively. And by enacting some version of the you see Timmy to your game, you're going to be giving your players a way to feel the advancement and the progression that they are getting into. And these nine steps are really one of my Christmas presents to you as a game master to give your game sessions a little bit more pop and a lot more uh, consistency session over session. And I hope you keep watching. We'll be doing more of these in the future. Right now, we're going to be switching over to talking about the various campaigns during the week. And so this will be leading into the Nikos News. Please stand by.